Welcome to the fifth in our PixHawk series. In the first video, we did the basic firmware and setup. The second video, we installed it onto a frame and did our first test flight. The third video, we talked about how to set up a Tyrannus radio so you can do everything you need to do with the PixHawk modes and flying. And then in the fourth video, we talked about the modes themselves, what they do and how you work with them. This video we're going to talk about how you power the PixHawk because the PixHawk, unlike the APM and uh, other boards, actually has the ability to have redundant power systems, which is a great idea but does make it a little bit complicated. So what I'm going to try and do in the next 10-15 minutes is dispel some of the complexity and take you through each of the steps. Now already in the video series we've talked about the fact that we're powering our PixHawk from a power module and that is plugging into a 3S battery and providing the plus 5 volts that the board and everything else needs to run and also we have connected some of the red wires from our ESCs along with the Xena diode to actually power the board. Now what I'll do here is we'll actually go through each side in turn and we'll talk about the options for each. First place that we'll start then is going to be the power port where we've plugged in our power module. Now the default option here of course is going to be for the power module that you get with a kit if you're ordering it. And these are typically good for up to 4S LiPo batteries. They not only provide the plus 5 volts on a couple of the wires that are needed, they also provide the ground as well on another couple of pins on the other side of the power module connection and they also provide information about the flight battery voltage and the amount of current that's been pulled as well. This is really good news because it allows you to do things like set up fail safes in case the battery starts to get too low or has a problem. Now this has to actually be configured in Mission Planner. You go into the additional hardware and then you make sure that things like PixHawk is set and then set the voltages that you want. It needs to be configured, you need to tell it what you want it to sense. But once you've done that, it's relatively straightforward. All of the hard work is done for you. The power module provides the power into the power inputs on the PixHawk itself and takes care of everything. What about if you want to use a bigger battery? Well, the second option that you have is to use something called an Atopilot power module. If you Google that, you'll find the information for it. It's good up to 50 volt input, so it'll run a 6S pack. There are different versions available that will run up 45 up to 180 amp sensing. So you can put this on much larger craft if you want to put the PixHawk on a great big whacking octocopter. Again, configuration is done through Mission Planner as we've just seen, uh, and it does still provide the current and voltage sensing. It is a separate power module you need to go out and get. I'll uh, put the link in the description for more information. But as you can see here, there's some great wiring diagrams and information out there. The third option, if you don't have a power module and you just want to power it using a good old fashioned battery eliminator circuit, is if you have a good BEC, you can plug it into the power port on the PixHawk directly. Just make sure that you're plugging in the plus 5 volts into pins 1 and 2 and you're plugging in the ground into pins 5 and 6. Obviously you lose the ability to do your current and voltage measurement, but it does mean that you're able to fly and power the board. I've actually done it this way on things like the APM 3.1. If you watch the APM 3.1 series where we installed it into a flying wing, you'll see me use this rather than put the weight of a power module onto the craft. Now the way it works here is that the plus five volts that you're putting in from any of these three options do not go through the PixHawk and out the side into the servo and motor outputs. So any of the plus 5 volts you're putting in here is really just to power the PixHawk, the GPS, telemetry radios, receiver and those pieces too. Anything that will pull a lot of current will go on the other side of the power system. So let's talk about that other side next. Your first option when you're plugging in all of your wires to run your motors is to use an ESC with a linear battery eliminator circuit. Now a linear battery eliminator circuit is a very simple circuit. All it does is reduce the battery voltage that's coming into the ESC down to the plus 5 volts by shedding the rest of the voltage as heat. Because of that they tend to run quite hot. It's getting harder and harder to get ESCs with linear BECs these days because more and more of them are starting to ship with switched. 
The great thing about linear BECs is that they are quite happy having all of the red plus 5 volt wires plugged in together because they don't compete with each other in the same way that other BECs do, and we'll cover that in a sec. I always use the Xenia diode. We talk about it in the web pages. Again, here's the image. I'll put a link in here if you want to read more about it. The Xenia diode just goes across a spare output at the back of the Pixhawk. And what that does is make sure that if there are any voltage spikes that go above 5.6, 5.7 volts, that the Xenia diode makes sure that can't happen. So in my instance, I'm actually using linear BEC. So in my model, I've actually installed all of the red wires. I would say be very careful installing all the red wires. My recommendation would be, unless you have a known setup that you know is completely happy working in that way, and I do, because these were previously working with an APM module, then I would only ever install one of the red wires and remove the other three red wires from the other three red connectors, if we're talking about a quadcopter, and just put them out of the way, wrap them with a bit of tape. Second option you've got then is to have ESCs that have switched battery eliminator circuits. Now, switched BECs are much more efficient. What they do is they chop up the voltage that's coming in from the battery into little spikes, and then they put that into some smoothing circuitry that then actually drops that to the five volts generates a lot less heat, much more efficient. The thing you have to be careful of with a switch BEC is that because the way it works, it's always listening to the voltage at the output and adjusting the circuitry inside to make sure that it's always the plus five volts that it's supposed to be delivering. The challenge is if you have multiple switch BECs plugged side by side, then the voltage that it's reading isn't the voltage that it's putting out onto the rail, it's the highest voltage that any of the other switch BECs is putting out on the rail because they're all connected together. That can cause some weird and wacky things to happen. So with switched BECs, always make sure that you're only ever installing one red wire. And again, install a Xena diode by it to make sure that if there's any problems that never goes above the 5.6, 5.7 volts. The last option that you have then is to use an Opto ESC. Now these are usually for larger batteries and they don't have any battery eliminator circuit in them. Because of that, you can absolutely connect the red wires to the output ports on the Pixhawk because it doesn't provide plus five volts. It hasn't got any of that circuitry in it at all. However, a lot of Opto ESCs actually want to see plus five volts on that red pin in order to initialize and power the onboard electronics. So in that case, what you have to do if you're using Opto ESCs, you have to install a separate battery eliminator circuit. Just get a little UBEC, a switched one. Uh, they're really cheap. You can get them from loads of different places and just pop that into one of the spare motor outputs by the side of the Opto ESC connections. That will then provide the plus five volts that those Opto ESCs need to initialize and run. And again, make sure you pop the Xena diode in so that there's no nasty surprises. The last thing to consider then is when you're using servos as part of the output. Now, servos can pull an awful lot of power. So if you're looking to install servos as part of your build, maybe to uh, run gimbals, to do things like retractable landing gear, those kind of things, then I would always recommend make sure that you're putting a battery eliminator circuit that's going to be big enough to power everything. So you're looking at a BEC that's maybe got three or four amps potentially, and don't use the BECs from the ESCs that you have plugged in. BECs that are part of an electronic speed controller are typically lower rated. There may be two, maybe three amps total. If you're running some large servos that are doing things like landing gear or tracks, those can pull a lot of current, particularly if they're being stalled or part of the linkages are a bit stiff, they can pull an awful lot of current. I've heard of problems where people have installed larger servos and just powered the Pixhawk using the plus five volts from the left-hand rail. The challenge with that is that if a servo then stalls and pulls too much current and the voltage drops, the entire Pixhawk will start to brown out and could potentially stop operation and reboot. So I would always recommend, personally, 
if you're going to fly a model like this, um, why not use a redundancy? Make sure that you have the default power module, the Atto Pilot, or a UBEC plugged into the power port on the right hand side on our diagram so that there's a clean plus 5 volts that's the only job is to run the Pixhawk and the associated electronics that are directly about the flight. And then I would plug in one of the battery illuminator circuits into the left hand side whether it's part of a linear or a switched ESC or whether or not it's actually a big whacking switched UBEC that's being used to power all of the servos on that rail as well. Benefit is is that if something does go wrong with the primary power going into the power module on the right hand side it will start to pull plus 5 volts from that output rail. It's better to have it and not need it. So in summary, for me, make sure you've got something plugged into the power port on the right hand side. Make sure that you've got at least one red wire with plus five volts going into the left hand side. Make sure you're always using that Xena diode. And if you're gonna be using any kind of servos, make sure that you have a battery eliminator circuit on the outputs alongside those servo wires that can easily supply enough current, not only when they're actually being used, but also if one of those servos has a problem, it doesn't completely pull the whole system down. Thank you for taking the time to watch that video. There are lots of other videos on the channel and they're carefully ordered into playlists. So you may find that there are other videos on this same subject that you can go and watch. So I would recommend going into the playlist area of Painless360 YouTube channel and looking around and seeing what there is. You never know what you might find. Thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe and happy flying.